this um, Advent season, the garden has, has, over the last few years, kind of taken advantage of these three or four weeks before Christmas, the Advent season, to really say, um, can we become a countercultural force uh, as the kind of the whole Western culture that we're part of gets caught up in the structures of, 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 of excess, often that uh, kind of travel around this end of the year with Thanksgiving and then Christmas and all of the you must haves in order for your children to be happy and not hate you and not be traumatized as they move into their adult life. They must have this thing um, and it's, it'll break so that we can get you to buy a new one next year, uh, you know, that kind of, kind of thing. And we've tried uh, with various ways, and this year particularly, uh, you know, with, with uh, in inviting you to consider um, using the stuff uh, that our world views so highly and that we also need to think about carefully, money, to uh, be a force of resistance, to be a countercultural force. And, and particularly this year under the rubric or under the kind of the umbrella of witness, we've talked about, uh, uh, about money, not nearly as much uh, as you probably have heard us say over and over again as Jesus does. He talks about it almost more than anything else uh, other than the kingdom. And it's not surprising that when he talks about money, it's often under the covering of the topic of the kingdom. And in fact, you might be getting tired of us talking about it so much. The reason we do, and Darren has said this over again, and I, I just want to just echo what he's been trying to get at, is that um, the reason Jesus goes after money so much is because he recognizes it as the chief contender for the hearts of, of his disciples. Uh, he, 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 and it's not just about money, because money in and of itself is just a, a measure. It's just a marker of what matters. That's why we talk about it. Because more than anything else, money measures what we say matters. Uh, and more than what we say matters, what actually matters to us. So I want to continue that theme a little bit, aware that uh, in the culture that we live in, to talk about giving often sounds self-serving for the church. When we talk about giving more, which is what really, frankly, I'm going to be saying, it sounds self-serving, and particularly after John has said what he has said about where we're at, uh, I, want, I want you to understand, though, that when we talk about giving, the, the, the church, that is the, 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 this organized gathering together of, we should never have to be anxious about meeting budget by the end of the year. We should never have to be. And the reason we are is because, candidly, roughly two-thirds of the folks who make Garden the Home have decided to ride on the one-third that are contributing what would be approximate to a tithe. Can we have that conversation? Is that all right? Yeah. Uh, it, we just need to. And, and, and again, it's not about shame. It's about saying, friends, we've got to think about if, if two-thirds of the, of the folks who consider Garden Home have, have, ha, are struggling, and I'm going to use this language because I think it's true, are struggling to organize your lives in such a way that you can do what your heart wants to do. Because you hear that announcement and you say, oh, gee, I wish I could be part of that solution. But I'm in student loan debt, $100,000. I, I married a couple this uh, about three weeks ago, six weeks ago, who combined debt will enter into their marriage $150,000 in debt with student loans. That's a house payment in every other part of the world but Los Angeles. <laughs> Which brings me to cause number two. We live in one of the most expensive places in the world to live. Some of you are spending between 50 and 60% of your disposable income so you have a roof over your heads. I get it. Really, I do. Um, some of you are caught up in systemic evil, and I use that word carefully but you're crushed in a system, sometimes willingly compliant to that system, but we are crushing a system 
uh, that is about excess. So, so can I just suggest to you, this, isn't, this, is, this is an opportunity to, I, I just want to invite you to consider if this is, this is a time when you need maybe to put a stake in the ground and start to invite Jesus into your financial realities. Because generosity, which is what I really want to talk about, is not about just about money, is it? It's about a set of the heart. It's, it's about time, it's about friendship, it's about hospitality. It's a, it's a real form of resistance to the culture of grab, to the culture of more, to the culture of give, me. Generosity says, I want to live with open hands and open hearts. And the reason I, I want you to think about it in these ways, if I can invite you to do that, is because we are created in the image of a God who lives like that. Right? Uh, if you look at the passage of Scripture that I'm going to frame, we've spent so much time on this text that it's, it's one that I hope will become just part of our structure, part of our, 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 our uh, self-understanding. But Genesis chapter 1 uh, verse 26, if we can throw that up, God said, let us make humankind in our image, in our likeness, so that they can rule over the fish of the sea, birds of the sky, livestock, all the wild animals, over all the creatures that move along the ground. So God created humankind in his own image. In the image of God, he created them, male and female, he created them. Then God blessed them, and God said to them, be fruitful, increase in number, fill the earth, subdue it, rule over the fish of the sea, the birds of the sky, over every living creature that moves on the ground. So this is a, a, a very familiar story, so much so that maybe you're not even, we're not able, able to hear it uh, because familiarity uh, uh, breeds uh, not just not contempt necessarily, uh, but um, we, we can't hear the nuances of this. So I want to suggest to you that among other things, among other things, um, this text invites us to consider exactly how we got here. Um, and, and this, as you know, is the tail end of, a, of, a, of the story of creation. Um, and every creative day begins with this language, God said, let there be. Right? I want you to sit with that for just a second. God said, let there be. light, matter, etc. right? So what are we as we gather together on this rock-solid planet we call Earth? What is it? It's nothing more and nothing less than the congealed word of God. This creation that we consider so solid is God's word. Hang on to that. And then remember what John said about God. God is love. So if God is love, then what does that make this universe? But nothing more and nothing less than an expression of his love. We live in an, exp if, 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 if the astronomers are correct, and I believe they are, God's love expressed in this universe is expanding at a rate that we cannot keep up with. That's the nature of the God who has created this world, right? And then he said to you and me, now look, I need somebody to embody that heart, that being, that way of existence so this planet always has a witness of my heart for them. And anybody want to guess who that is? We are created to be his image. 
we are created to be an expression of his heart for this world. This is why for God, if love can't accomplish an outcome, nothing else will work. Any outcome that love can't accomplish is not an outcome God is willing to go towards. This is hard for us because we're willing to give love a chance. Three or four times, five or six if it's really extreme. But then seven or eight, no, we want judgment. We want condemnation. We want power. And God says, no, 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 no. This is my body. It's broken. If love won't work, the outcome is not worth achieving. So if we are created as the image of God, and God is love, and this world is congealed, if you will, love, embodied love, please notice that generosity, which is an expression, this world, this world exists because God is a generous God. Love seeks an object. Love seeks, seeks an expression. Love can't, by definition, remain self-contained. It expresses itself. It expresses itself in radical generosity. And please notice, generosity without control. Did you notice when God said, let there be? He didn't issue all kinds of rules and regulations within which the let there be must be exercised. He trusted creation. He trusted creation. And that, by the way, got us into a lot of trouble. It would have been much easier if he'd issued a rule book within which love ought properly, within which generosity ought properly be exercised. But he didn't do that. God doesn't give towards an outcome. God gives because he's a giver. It's his nature. It's just what he does because it is who he is. Now, does that mean that some folks may abuse the life that God has given them, that some elements of creation might take advantage of the generosity of a God who gives without measure of control? Is it possible that somebody might actually take advantage of that love? And the answer, of course, is... Yes, and he doesn't stop giving, therefore. Why? Because that's who he is. He can't not give. He can't not be generous. And and the reason I'm playing around with this a little bit is because I'm going to invite you into a non-controlling, radical generosity as a way of life. Ultimately, this is where we we want to be heading. We want to organize our lives, structure our lives, so that we can be as radically generous as the Father whose image we are created in. How many are you glad that God is not generous the way you are? (laughs) Anybody else take advantage of his just? Well, that's that's, that's, that's cool, because about 85% are happy that he's generous the way you are. We are generous as a way of controlling out. Have you, ever, have you ever had some money in your pocket and not given it to somebody because that person would make use of it in a way that you th- wouldn't approve of? As if you're using it in the way that the guy who gave it to you would approve of. <laughs> what, what the heck? <laughs> who died and made you God? I mean, come on. <laughs> You see what I'm saying? See what I'm saying? Or, or no, I don't, I don't like the way they're running that church. I don't li- I, they've made some decisions here that I just don't approve of. Really? 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 No, 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 no. no hear me out. I've been in churches for 60 plus years. Not a one of them has done things the way I think they ought to have done them, including <laughs> the one that I was running. 
I don't, I don't get to control outcomes with my generosity. I just don't get to do that. This is why God says, look, look, buddy, I can't trust you with this completely yet. We're on the way. We're, we're making good progress. But I, what, here's, you, don't, you, don't, you don't get to vote on this. I want you to take the first 10% of your money and I want you to give it. But God, what if they don't use it properly? I'll take care of them. Right now I'm taking care of you. Do, do you see what he's up to here? He doesn't need it to run his organization for crying out loud. God not only owns the cattle on a thousand hills, he owns the Cadillacs on a thousand hills. He doesn't need your money. But we need to let loose of it. We need to let loose of the control that it has over us. And because we are created to be his image, and because God is a generous God, we are invited into that same pattern of radical, radical generosity. He gave it without control. He gave it towards freedom. He gave it so that those to whom he gave it would themselves learn how to give. And this is why the principle in the New Testament and the Old Testament is not ownership, but stewardship. It's an old-fashioned word. It just means it's not yours. It means it belongs to him. You are a steward of the one whose resources they are. And by the way, he has no problem with you enjoying the benefits of your stewardship. He just doesn't. He's very glad for you to prosper. In fact, he wish you would do it more. Properly understood, God is not more blessed by poverty than he is by wealth. The challenge is that the wealthy people think that they got there by themselves. No, 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 no. You, you, you are the recipients of an evil system often that has impoverished others who are victims of that same evil system. That's why if you are the beneficiary of that system, then you need to use those resources that are not yours, that came to you, right? Maybe through your hard work, maybe through an accident of birth, Maybe through the structures of a system that you benefit. Take advantage of those and push back against a culture that says, because you're wealthy, you're smart. Or because you're wealthy, you're good. Or because you're wealthy, there's something about you admirable as opposed to these folks down here. Here's 10 things these people do every day. Excuse me. These people are busy putting food on the table. They don't have time to do those 10 things. This guy slept under a bridge last night so that you can contribute to your 401k in excess. Come on. Do, do, do you see what we're after here? Right? Now, this doesn't mean this guy can't be generous. It's just that his or her generosity is going to be different than this guy's generosity. To whom much is given... Given, much is required, right? Much is required. So if you don't have a car, God will never ask you to be responsible for what you did with your car. <laughs> but if you got 18, he's going to ask you, what did you do with those 18 cars that I gave you? Do you see? because they're not yours. What did you do with them? And by the way, God loves good cars. <laughs> you with me? He really, it's, it's, those are irrelevancies, right? He created us to be his image. Of course we're going to be creative. Of course we're going to develop things. But do you see the system of, of, of Jubilee? Remember the year of Jubilee that we talked about? Every 50 years, everything goes back in the box and gets redistributed equally. Can you feel the burn? <laughs> Sorry. I just couldn't resist. 
oh, we don't want to be socialistic. You're right, we don't. We want to be generous. So if you have and your brother does not, this isn't about charity. This is about family. Right? This is not about, well, they, no, no, no. There is no they. They are us. Do, do, do you see? So if we can, if we, this is why the Jubilee system is so genius and why it never worked. <laughs> why didn't it work? Because by the time I have the power that wealth gives me, I'm not likely to let loose of it. And because I have the power of disobedience supported by a judicial system that I've paid off, nobody's going to make me do the right thing. Do do, do you see? And God says, oh, oh, this isn't going well. And the temptation is more rules, more regulations, more structures of control. That's the temptation. Fortunately, God doesn't yield to that temptation. He wants more love. Because that changes the human heart and shifts us into being more accurate representatives of him. Do you see, do you see what he's up to here? So as we, as we sit in this, in this passage of stewardship, uh, excuse me, this passage of scripture here that talks about stewardship, this, this, this caring for the planet, rule here doesn't mean supervise. Rule doesn't mean boss around. Rule, dear God, help us, doesn't mean rape. It doesn't mean ravish. It doesn't mean take advantage of for your own sake and to its detriment and death. We ought to be environmentalists. We ought to be leading the charge in caring for the planet. Why? Because that's what we're here for. Right? Do, do, do you see what we're after? Now, in that, God has no problem with utilizing the resources of the planet the way it was intended. That's why he gave it to us. He, what? Gave it to us so that we can learn the same pattern of generosity, right? So we're invited into that kind of, kind of understanding. We are never more like God than when we are generous, than when we give. That's the marker. And we are never more unlike him when we are stingy and greedy and justify it you're never more unlike him than when we do that. And I say we, because sometimes I get afraid. Sometimes I'm, I'm worried about my future. Do, 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 you, do you know? I'm 62 years old. Sooner or later, I don't want to work as hard as I'm working. And I am watching every election. I'm watching every blip on the Dow Jones average. I am watching Wall Street, and it's making me crazy. <laughs> it's a roller coaster of anxiety. Why do I do that? Because I think my future depends on my wit, <laughs> my ability, my cleverness, my wisdom. As it turns out, not so much for which I'm very thankful, because there's not a lot of that. Do, do, do you see? But I have to be reminded. I have to remind myself of how good God is, and that just because I'm 60 doesn't mean he's forgotten how to take care of me the way he did when I was an infant, when I was a child. Do, do you see what we're after? So I want to learn to live generously to create space for entry into the kind of person that I am. A lot of us have no room to receive anything new from God because we haven't let loose of what he's blessed us with 10 years ago. We have no capacity for anything new because we're hoarding the rotting old. 
God, as well, is a joyful, joyous giver. Of course, all of this is echoed in the life of Jesus. You see it um, in the passage that we looked at uh, a few weeks ago in Matthew chapter 5, where Jesus is just kind of outlining what's important to him. How am I doing? Oh, good. All right. So he says, you're the salt of the earth. You're the light of the world. Let your light shine before others that they may see what? Your radical generosity with the resources I've put in your hands, namely your life. And the outcome of that will be that they will glorify your father in heaven. But then he starts to unpack what that means. And this is where he ends up. You've heard it said, eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth. I tell you, don't resist an evil person. Go back. Thanks. I know you're trying to save me from this passage. <laughs> if anyone slaps you on the right cheek, turn to them also the other cheek. This is where he's going with the salt of the earth, light of the world. We've got way many, way more, way many. <laughs> We've got a whole boatload of examples of people who slapped on the right cheek, don't turn the other cheek, but unload with a howitzer. He's saying, no, 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 no. Guys, if love doesn't work, howitzers won't either. So turn the other cheek. That means let people take advantage of you. Properly boundaried selves are required in order to enable this without loss. Then he goes on. If anyone wants to sue you and take your shirt, give them your coat too. If anyone forces you to go one mile, go two miles. And here's the one. Give to the one who asks. Don't turn away from the one who wants to borrow from you. Now, is Jesus saying, do this mindlessly? The way I'm asking the question, you'll know my answer. No. He's not saying everybody that asks stuff of you, you have to give them. That's not what he's saying. This isn't new law. This is, however, the kind of culture that love enables over time. You can be generous when, just because people ask without having to analyze whether they actually have the possibility of repaying or whether they deserve your generosity. You can actually not be anxious about that at all. Just the ask is a good enough reason to give. Notice the freedom in that. Notice the freedom in that. I have over the years been asked to lend money to people. I never do. I'm happy to give it to them, but I will never lend. Because I don't want them to see me as one to whom they owe anything other than the debt of love. And I don't want to see them as, come on. And I know my heart well enough to know that that's what would happen. Do, just, do you see? This is, this, is, this is so hard to talk about because I'm still learning this as we go along here. This salt light, preservation, illumination, comfort, guidance in the dark. Jesus wants us to become the kinds of people who can give when we're asked who can give without reward or thought of repayment, who are not concerned about being used, who are not, not, not thoughtlessly, but mindfully. Jesus, Jesus has no problem, by the way, saying no to people when they ask him to do stuff. So he's not just saying universally, stop thinking and just say yes all the time. That's not what he's saying, because God isn't more glorified by, as gl more glorified by poverty than he is by wealth. That, that's not the issue. The issue is, wherever you are, what are you doing with where you're at? So he invites us into a thoughtful um, uh, orientation towards the world as givers, not takers. Here's Paul's famous language, which I, I love so much those who are anxious in Thessalonica about how the world is going. He says, look, 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 mind your own business. 
Make it your job to get a job. Make a contribution. That's the norm. That's the normal expectation of the people of God, to be givers, not takers. Now, I will say that every giver is also a receiver, and that that also is about generosity. There are some of you who you have people in your life who are trying to bless you, and your pride is resisting their gift. Don't be doing that to them. Let their soul breathe. Let their soul breathe. I remember the first time. Actually, it's the only time. No, that's not true. <laughs> I remember the very first time one of my boys wanted to buy me lunch. And my, my dad self said, no way, I'm the dad. I'm supposed to be paying for you, you. But I didn't say that. Because sometimes you feel that way. It's like, I love you. All right? And here's my boy. And I let him. And you should have seen him swell into himself. That's also generosity. Right? That's also generosity. So for all of you parents, the podcast will be up on Monday. <laughs> um, so it's important. And I, I, I want to say one more thing. I know I'm running tight on time here. But it's important that we recognize that God is not opposed to disciples with wealth. Jesus counted on them, particularly wealthy women, to support his mission in ministry. Luke chapter 8 makes it very clear that Jesus needs men and women whose wealth is at the uh, control of their heavenly father. Yeah? So... And, and in fact, some of you have been specifically blessed to generate wealth, to generate income. And that's wonderful, to multiply resources. Of course, the key thing is to remember that that capacity doesn't make you special or important or smart. It just means that you're really good at making money. Now, are you really good at knowing what to do with it? That's the key. So remember... Generosity is not just about money, it's about heart and life. If we are as radically generous as our Heavenly Father is, that will show up in a lot of ways. Some of you can be generous with time or with friendship or with shared silence with somebody, with hospitality. What are the resistances to this? You know what they are. We're afraid. We're insecure. What is it that drives out fear? love. Uh, some of us have misused our resources that God has given us and we are in such debt that we couldn't afford to be generous. I get it. But can I suggest that maybe now would be a time to start to incrementally push back against that? Maybe we've been seduced by the spirit of the age and it's time to repent. Or maybe nobody ever told us. So I'm telling you, start, start somewhere and build a traction and a track record of generosity. Let's pray.